Well, hello and welcome everyone to our co-sponsored webinar by RHEL Central and well, RHEL West titled Successes and Lessons Learned, a District's Perspective on Early Warning Systems. It's our pleasure to host this webinar with you today. Let me start with introductions. My name is Jason Harlicker. I'm a senior researcher with RHEL Central at Marzano Research. I'm the Research Alliance lead for the Systems Development and Improvement Research Alliance which assists educators with examining and improving their school-wide or district-wide systems. I'm a previous school psychologist with experience implementing and supporting educators with tiered frameworks, such as multi-tiered system of support. I will be facilitating this webinar with Ken Winderby, who is a senior research associate with RHEL West at WestEd. She is a member of the Dropout Prevention Alliance team in Utah, and she provides technical assistance to local and state educators to help support at-risk students, including implementation of early warning systems at a local level. I wanted to also introduce John Rice, who is also helping to facilitate this webinar. He is a senior research associate with RHEL West at WestEd, and he develops and directs evaluations with local, statewide, and national agencies, and monitors project activities and budget expenditures. He's also the Research Alliance lead for the Nevada Education Research Alliance. Our goal for this webinar is to share the story of one district's use of early warning systems. That district is Washoe County School District, which is located in Reno, Nevada. Washoe is the second largest district in the state of Nevada and serves 63,000 students in 93 schools. Today we'll cover a brief overview of early warning systems and then we'll get into Washoe's story and how their use of early warning systems came to be. They'll discuss two main topics, beginning with how they developed their early warning system, including how they identified a need for an early warning system and how they built buy-in for it. They'll also discuss how they identified the indicators to use within their early warning system. So we're pleased to have both Ben Hayes and Trish Schaefer from Washoe County School District today. Washoe County School District's Chief Accountability Officer, Ben Hayes, has been working with public schools for 15 years since completing his graduate degree in experimental psychology from the University of Nevada in Reno. In 2009, Ben Hayes helped create the district's first research and evaluation department dedicated to providing schools, the district, and the broader education community with data products, research, and support needed to make effective decisions based on high-quality, user-friendly data. He oversees all research and evaluation, accountability, data products, and school performance planning for the district. Trish Schaefer is the coordinator for multi-tiered system of supports and social and emotional learning in Washoe County School District. In her 16 years in public education, she has worked in general and special education settings in both the classroom and at the district level, holding degrees in education, behavior analysis, speech, language pathology, and educational leadership. Trish has also spent time teaching at the college and university level, as well as consulting with other school districts. So for our agenda today, we're going to have myself share an overview of early warning systems, after which Trish and Ben will share Washoe's story. They will both discuss building support for early warning systems within the district, as well as how their district selected and uses their current indicators. We'll pause for a couple questions in the middle of the webinar, and we'll close the webinar with more questions and lessons learned. So this, this webinar is focused on early warning systems, which are defined as database models that match students to interventions with the goal of improving graduation rates and decreasing dropout. Early warning systems typically use attendance, office referrals, and course grades to identify students who are at risk for school dropout and then provide those students with a corresponding intervention. The intervention provided targets the risk factor that the student is displaying in order to increase the student's attachment and performance in school, therein reducing the risk for dropout. So we can think of early warning systems as five major steps that a district or school completes, the first of which is to establish a team to oversee the early warning system. This team will use data to identify students who are at risk, identify interventions for those students, and then monitor progress of the students to determine how effective the interventions are. 
The team structure will vary between districts depending on the size of the districts and their resources. But a common example would be that districts will identify a district level team for early warning systems and then each school will have a team that manages the system for their own site. The second step is to identify the accurate indicators for identifying students who are at risk for school dropout. Excuse me. The most common data used are attendance, behavior referrals, and course grades. However, districts will actually run the statistical analyses to determine if those data actually do predict school dropout and risk for their students. They may, <clears throat> excuse me, they may also analyze other indicators, such as number of suspensions or expulsions or state testing results. Once the indicators are identified, the third step is to then provide efficient reports for staff to use when reviewing the data. The reports should compile the data so that it's easy to interpret, and the reports should also clearly indicate which students are at risk for dropout. The fourth step is where students are actually matched to interventions. Teams will review the data on students and then match them to an appropriate intervention. Teams can use the indicator data to match students to specific interventions, as the data may indicate what intervention may be more beneficial for one student over another. So for example, a student who scored at risk and had a lot of truancy and attendance issues may benefit from a mentoring intervention, whereas a student who scored poorly on course grades may benefit from a tutoring intervention. And then the final step involves the team meeting regularly, regularly to examine the impact of the interventions. Teams will examine which students are in interventions and how they are performing with that intervention. When evaluating student progress, the early warning system team will also consider the fidelity of the intervention. This is to ensure that the student was provided the intervention in the manner that it was intended to be implemented. So much more detailed information is provided in this resource, A Practitioner's Guide to Implementing Early Warning Systems, developed by RHEL Northwest and published in 2015. The guide is based off of a national scan of literature describing successful strategies for implementation by early warning system teams across the United States. It is available at the link. So finally, I just wanted to mention how early warning systems align with tiered models such as MTSS. Trish and Ben can speak uh, to how they coordinated efforts within their district. But essentially, the interventions that early warning systems have available can be embedded within a school-wide tiered framework where you have universal, targeted, and intensive supports, which is your tier one, tier two, and tier three. So you can see how these models really overlap in that both use data to identify students for support. Okay. So now it's my pleasure to turn the webinar over to Trish Schaefer and Ben Hayes, and they'll share their story with Washo. Trish and Ben. Thank you, Jason. Um, uh, I wanted to kind of say early on that our essential question in, in this, um, and I'm kind of, a, as you said, and thank you for your introduction, um, kind of an accountability guy with the district, but it's always been important to me that we integrate well with all of the other offices and, and schools in the district, not just kind of pump out spreadsheets and that kind of stuff. So really the essential question came for became for us kind of, can an early warning system um, be used to develop better awareness, make better relationship and, uh, and supports and wraparound services for students along their pathway to graduation? And that's a K-12 pathway. Uh, we didn't want it to just be kind of a, a, a predictive model um, or kind of a data tool that, hey, these kids might be in danger. Uh, we wanted it to kind of go and let it be a tool to where there's a signal sent that, hey, let's try to check in with these kids and give them the services they need if they need it. Sometimes we'll check in with kids at the moderate risk or something like that, and they'll, be, they'll have a lot of momentum and they're fine. So uh, just off the bat, I wanted to say, and Trish has been incredibly helpful with this, um, we want to use this as a tool, just like um, Paul Font says, uh, it, it's worthless all by itself. It needs to be accompanied by interventions and kind of use in an educational set setting. So if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see kind of the urgency that prompted the need for this early warning system. Uh, and, and that was, we in our district came out with the cohort graduation rate uh, 
we started looking at it before it became part of accountability and became part of the rest of the nation's kind of report card. Uh, and because it, the National Governors Association had said this is a good metric to look at. Um, and you'll see that there was an incredible kind of long run of stagnant graduation rates. Uh, and when you, there's no excuse for a system to have just barely over one out of two kids graduating. Some of that was data cleanup um, and making sure kind of that kids who transferred to a different district and, and were doing fine there that we recorded that transcript. But uh, that wasn't a big part of it. And we're still below 60% and it, it was alarming to all of us. And anyone listening to this uh, will not be surprised that those 56% weren't um, crossing the stage at the same rate in every single population. There were uh, really frightening achievement gaps among that already low 56%. So we also looked into that and kind of saw that, you know, the average credits earned was only seven out of, just above seven out of 22 and a half. So these kids were sending us signals all along that something, something was happening on their graduation pathway. Uh, the credits earned uh, range from about zero to 22. And uh, if in Nevada, you need at least 22 and a half to graduate. So that was another alarming thing. And then the average GPA was just above 1.5. Uh, so again, all kinds of alarm bells, uh, but if you start looking into those alarm bells, it shouldn't have surprised any of us that, look, no wonder we're graduating so few kids. We're not paying attention to the ones that are falling off the pathway. So it became an urgent thing for us. We all kind of gathered around, uh, and when I say we all, a, a big system, uh, hundreds of people, kind of what are we going to do, community members? And one of the first things we kind of came out with, if you look on the next slide, uh, some of the research, uh, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Some of the research, a uh, big influence, a guy named Paul LaMarca and I uh, first started looking through things. He had gone to a conference before and had some ideas on kind of early relationship indicators and that kind of thing. Uh, there was a, about the same time a really good paper that came out by Robert Balfons about kind of predicting graduation dropout or risk of dropout very early on um, with certain indicators that uh, you could focus on. So there were two kind of clear paths of student engagement that we look at. One is academic failure and struggle, and that's kind of the traditional one that everybody, it, it, it might seem obvious to. The second one is behavioral reactions to school. So maybe kids are misbehaving because they're uh, frustrated with school, they're averted, uh, uh, averse to school, they're not engaged, uh, they don't have a sense of belonging and that kind of thing. That became kind of two sides, almost two sides of the same coin to us. So it could be that um, kids who are experiencing academic struggle are uh, behaving and acting out um, out of frustration, um, but also kids who aren't engaged um, and are kind of missing days. Uh, and not engaged in school might be giving up and struggling academic. So uh, those two things kind of pointed at us. And then given the, the Balfont's paper from 2007, and he kind of predicted, look, th we know this. We know this kind of things in eighth grade and sixth grade. So he also said it's not too late. I mean, the whole idea of a predictive model is to interrupt that prediction. So. Uh, he had some kind of a lot of work early on and still is doing a lot at the Everyone Graduate Center for early interventions targeting kind of students who are, who are off the pathway. So that kind of gave us a lot of hope, gave us uh, some compelling evidence that, hey, we could really make a difference here. So we initially developed this risk index in, in grades seventh and ninth. So those when in our district you transition into middle school in seventh grade. Uh, transition in high school and ninth grade. So we kind of put together spreadsheets uh, and emailed them to all the secondary principals and said, hey, these kids might be at risk for dropping out, take a look, and that kind of thing. Um, and, and it was kind of clunky. It was a spreadsheet. So, But people did start using it uh, early on, and we kind of talked to people. We ran a bunch of data, and we started kind of seeing that, oh, wait, this thing it is useful and it is engaging some people. So if you look at the next slide, we did some more analysis on kind of figuring out how can we fine tune it, how can we make it um, as meaningful as it can be. We ended up going to do 
some analysis and saying to ourselves um, and to our principals that is actually useful for all grades, not just seventh and ninth. Um, it was just important to look at risk or early warning in third grade uh, as it was maybe in eleventh grade. So through uh, some data analysis and, and gathering what data we could out of our student information system, we came up with the, the indicators of attendance, um, which is huge in our district. We looked at our all of our own data to see kind of how much things should be weighted, what should we include, what has kind of a, a relationship with different outcomes. Attendance, transiency, so if a child moved from um, different schools during the year, came from outside of the district, and if they moved more than uh, once to schools, that was a little bit of higher risk. Uh, and then, of course, the retention and the out-of-age um, indicator we included right away. And it's a small number in our district, but it turns out to be pretty uh, predictive, especially in the face of legislation of read by three that kids might be in danger of being held back in grade three. It's certainly not something that, uh, <laughs> well, I'll leave it there. Uh, and then we left test scores in there uh, initially. Um, they actually turned out to be pretty useful, but as you'll see in a minute, uh, we actually ended up taking them out eventually, uh, and we believe it's just as useful without them. Credit deficiency, that's kind of going from the ABCs, um, the attendance, behavior, and core courses. Um, credit deficiency was the best data that we had at the time um, and turned out to be pretty predictive. And that's why we wait, and, and then suspension, of course, is a huge indicator. So in parentheses, you'll see a 0 to 2 or a 0 to 4, and that's how we weighted. So for attendance, um, a student can have a 0, meaning that they've attended um, very much of the time, a 1, meaning that maybe they missed between kind of um, 6 and 0, or 1 and 6 percent of, I mean, I'm sorry, 6 or more percent of their days, uh, and then a 2 then they're missing more than 10% of their days. Uh, same with transiency, if they move one school or two schools, the, the risk goes higher. And you can see, uh, like for example, credit deficiency. We ran out all the distributions of these indicators and found out kind of how they related to the negative outcomes that we didn't want our students to experience. Um, so attendance, zero, one, or two turned out to be a strong weight, a good enough weight to give a strong signal. Credit deficiency, there was such a distribution, a child can miss, let's say, one credit or one and a half credits um, and still kind of catch up. But once you get down to you know missing three credits or so on, then it puts the child at higher risk. So we felt like that one deserved, a, according to our data, needed a little bit of a stronger weight in the, in the model. Um, and then suspension. Uh, again, zero to one, not a ton of get, kids get suspended, but too many, um, and then any suspension kind of puts you in, into a flag. So if you look at the, the next slide, um, you, you can just see, I wanted to touch on um, the test scores. So definitely ABCs uh, are important, and we feel that moving schools just sends a signal that we want to kind of welcome the child when they get to a new school. Um, have uh, a little bit of examination of how they're doing, what supports they might need, uh, what curriculum they might be used to, and how we can ease that transition. But we, uh, during the transition from our old legacy criterion reference test, or our state test, if you will, to we're an SBAC state or a standards, uh, Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium state, during that transition, we didn't have really test scores, and we've gotten people used to look at looking at the risk index uh, all the time. So when we didn't have test scores, we thought, well, maybe we can drop them out since we don't have them. Should we look at anything to replace it? And after a few years of using this, it turned out that the model is just as predictive without assessment scores. Um, so we think that, and we went back and looked kind of retrospectively too, and that, that held to be true. So. I don't think that we'll put assessment scores back in. And I was lucky enough to be at a small convening um, with the Ball Fonts group um, last week. And a, a lot of people that are using early warning systems around the country have said that the fewer indicators, I mean, you don't want to just focus on one or two, but you also don't want to make the system too noisy so that people start getting distracted by different indicators. So the fewer indicators that we can focus on, the better. 
that was really compelling um, to me to just kind of leave these out. Now, our next kind of generation we'll talk about later, later we want to fine tune it a little bit for, let's say, K through three, um, the middle grades, and then also for high school. But we, I just wanted to say to the group that uh, the assessment scores were fine to take out, and it's probably a little bit more predictive, actually. That's something that we use we in our in our trainings uh, to show exactly how each variable is made up or each indicator is made up and how each student kind of gets the score that they get. Uh, so the history of the risk index or the early warning system then became, okay, let's instead of seventh and ninth grade in just a spreadsheet, let's start sending it to all schools at the beginning of the year to show which students might be. Uh, at risk of falling off the graduation pathway. How can we intervene early? We started working more with uh, the multi-tiered systems support group and getting them to use it in their training, getting them to use it in their early warning system, uh, in their uh, intervention assistance teams trainings and other, uh, other database decision-making team trainings. And then we tried to get it as, to as many educators as possible. So we were building a data warehouse at the time and this became a foundation of that. I believe that was the first report we built was the, the early warning system. So every, every educator in our system has access to an early warning system list of all their students at any given time. Um, and then we designed it purposefully to, you can drill down, you can see, and obviously there, there are more reports in the data warehouse, um, so you can see kind of your current enrollment, what their attendance is, academic achievement. Uh, interim assessment scores and things like that, but we purposely built in a, a good section on uh, early warning system or risk index, so they could always see at any given time how many uh, of their students are at even a low risk or moderate risk or high risk. Uh, and then we also purposely designed the warehouse, if you look at the next slide, so that we could drill down to kind of any grade level, any student population, and ultimately to any student. So. This is kind of the, uh, an example of the last layer of our uh, data warehouse system, and it shows up in the upper right-hand corner. This is a this is a sample middle school student, uh, and you can see kind of throughout the page what their interim assessment results were, what the regular assessment results were, courses, uh, courses where they may be engaged and not engaged. But then in the upper right-hand corner, um, some prominent attention is given to the early warning system. And that helps, too, because students uh, and teachers can discuss it as long as they discuss it appropriately and say, okay, so what are some services uh, and supports we can wrap around this child with? Uh, and at the beginning, and, and I'm kind of hesitant about talking to the child about this. Certainly, they should know whatever information we have with them. Um, but language, as Trish will discuss later, language like risk and warning and stuff like that seems a little have to, to have a little bit of a negative valence. So we're kind of, and Trish has been great about this, and her team has have been great about this, having good, thoughtful, problem-solving discussions on how you approach this, how you use it with students, uh, and things like that. And then finally, the data warehouse updates and calculates. So whatever information we have that uh, is in the risk index, it updates it every night. So if a turn, if a child, we always have at least one year of risk uh, in the left-hand column. So risk, uh, risk or early warning can be calculated on a full year's worth of data from the previous school year. And then kind of a running or rolling risk uh, in the right-hand column that would show, you know, if a child clicked over into less than 90% attendance, then a flag will pop up right away. Uh, or if a child gets suspended and goes to another school, the educators at that next school will know right away, that, okay, so uh, this is something, let's ease the transition, let's engage this child right away and, and do what we can. Okay, so the next section, uh, this is still Ben, the, uh, I want to, or we wanted to show some, describe the risk index a little bit and its kind of relationship to outcomes. So first, this is more of a description slide. Uh, and it's the demographics uh, of our race and ethnicity. And on the next slide, you'll see uh, a breakdown between different student populations. And the point behind these is that, number one, there's no student population that 
doesn't it have students within it that are kind of at, at risk for dropping out or falling off the graduation rate uh, pathway. In other words, every student um, has a story out there and every student faces some obstacles. But the converse of that, not every student population um, faces some obstacles and has the same kind of early morning signals. So early on we kind of looked at these data and we continue to and use them as kind of a hopeful tool, if, especially with the intervention stuff, to narrow the achievement gap. So I heard someone saying uh, recently, uh, lots of people have said it too, so I'm not giving give this one person credit, but uh, it's not about equality and giving everybody access to the same thing. Equity is truly kind of meeting the child where they are and giving them the supports they need so that we can all choose equal or have equal opportunities um, when they leave our graduation stage. So this has been, um, even though it, it might look bleak, uh, it's been a great signal for us to, hey, we can uh, intervene early, wrap around, give supports early, and uh, hopefully eliminate the achievement gap um, by use of an early warning system and its signals. Uh, the next section is about kind of how prescient is the early warning system. And it's funny, to me, and I've laughed about it before with other people, but none of this should surprise any of us, so it almost seems not worth showing the slides, that of course, if you develop an early warning system based on data, you're going to see relationships on, on that data to student outcomes, right? Um, so, but if you kind of step out of that uh, frame for a second, it has been really compelling to educators to see the relationship between this and outcomes because they all want to do the right thing. They all want to get those equitable outcomes for students. So showing these next few slides and kind of the relationship to almost any outcome that you can think uh, has actually been a big compelling part of getting people to use it and design interventions around it. So that this next slide shows uh, suspensions and of the, our population with no risk indicators, um, only 3% of them uh, got suspended within one year. Um, at, so this is at the beginning of the year looking at their risk data or their early warning signals. Um, what outcomes did they experience within one year? Uh, no risk, 3% of them got suspended. That goes all the way up to 20% or one out of five of the high risk students. Uh, and then the next one shows kind of the proficiency or meeting standards on the old state test. So you can see, uh, and I, I should mention here that our district has uh, a 90%, and we, I'll say quickly and, and we'll show you later, we have made progress since that 56% uh, back in 2009, but our goal has become 90% um, by the year 2020. Uh, and over and over we see these indicators that are just about 90%. Um, and this is one of them. So kids meeting proficiency tend to have a real strong relationship to graduating on time. Um, and this 89%, we want, and hopefully with the use of an early warning system and lots of intervention um, kind of resources and attention, uh, we can get it so that through use of the early warning system, no child kind of is at risk for not graduating because we've intervened early and kind of given provided the supports we need to. So. That's one way we think we'll get to the 90% mark. Uh, the next slide shows suspension again, but this is, uh, earlier I said we took uh, assessment out of the mix, and this is, the previous one was using uh, kind of assessment uh, as, as a risk warning or early warning signal as well. This is almost the same exact pattern, um, and it's no assessment data. Uh, so the pattern before with using student achievement was 3% in no risk, 5% in low risk, 8% in moderate risk, and 23% of high risk, or 20% of high risk. And this same exact pattern except for it's 23% uh, among the high risk students. So uh, it, it's a cleaner kind of signal for us and uh, we're able to focus on it a little bit better. The next slide shows, and I won't go into it too much, but what we use for in the state of Nevada for student growth measure is the student growth percentile model uh, by Damian Bader-Benner. And I won't go into the whole model, but it's normed, so no risk, or you can see the 55 among the no risk population. That means they were the median student in that group outgrew 55% of his or her academic peers. So, and an academic peer is 
whether they're low performing or high performing, they're compared to those similar types of kids. So, uh, and you can see again this um, unfortunate linear relationship uh, all the way down to the high risk kids. And a 41 would imply that those children are being out, that typical child in that group is being outgrown by 59% uh, of his or her academic peers. So the signal this sends to us is that the kids who really need the most kind of catch-up work and need to be accelerating a little bit more are actually growing uh, the slowest. So again, the, the urgent call for services and supports and wraparound for those, those students. Um, and it doesn't always have to be these intense services. It can just be relationships and supports for a lot of these guys. The next slide um, is, is an interesting one to me. And um, of course, it's going to be, given everything the audience has seen, this isn't surprising that GPA is, uh, again, related to risk. But the thing that jumps out to me, this, and we know from so much research that extracurricular activities are often the, kind of the glue that keeps kids along, um, giving them that, that sense of belonging to their school and to their kind of education pathway. And oftentimes, the cutoff point for being able to even participate in extracurricular activities is a 2.0 grade point average. Um, and again, the kids that need it the most, um, or maybe would benefit the most by it, aren't even eligible to participate. Another strong signal that uh, we got to do some, some work and some uh, engagement with some of these students. And then finally, the last slide is uh, graduation. and. You can look, again, it's this, this linear relationship. And, and again, there's that 89, almost 90% number. So the students that with no risk have 89% uh, graduation rate four years later. And I apologize, I should have said earlier, this is we looked at students four years ago coming into ninth grade uh, and how they did within four years if they graduate, what their graduation outcome was four years later. Uh, and again, 89% graduation rate for those with no risk. And that drops down to only 67, even with moderate risk, and all the way down to 31% with high risk. Um, and then you can see the red bar that goes from 3% with no risk. These are dropouts um, that, that kind of gave up on our system, uh, or our system gave up on them, uh, all the way up to 39%. So in the high risk group, there were more students that dropped out than graduated. And that's something that we kind of continue to use as urgency in our system. So, and again, we're kind of, again, compelled by that 89% number. If we can do something uh, really strongly to moderate the risk among all of our students, then we think we can get to that 90% uh, graduation rate. And then the following slide is kind of our call to action that we use in our district. 31% um, of those students with high risk, they did graduate. So what did we do anything, um, or were there specific competencies that they had, were there different resilience flags that they, those students had that helped them to kind of push through? And the more we can learn from those kids, the better off we'll be as a system. So now I'm going to turn it over to Trish Schaefer, Schaefer, who does a lot of the kind of dissemination and training work around with through the MTSS, our multi-tiered system of supports. Uh, work and a lot of social emotional work and kind of her work with behavior too. So, Trish. Trish, let me uh, interrupt real quick. Um, just a quick question. One was, what does CIT and GT stand for on the risk index? Oh, I apologize. Uh, we're guilty of acronyms like everyone else. So, CIT is uh, children in transition. So, students without a permanent housing or without permanent housing. So it could be homeless, um, doubled up with friends, sleeping on someone's couch, uh, and that, or, or living in kind of transient housing. Uh, and then GT is our gifted and talented uh, education program. OK, and I have, I have one more, and I think it's more of a clarification. Um, I don't see the credit deficiency in the components of your system. Was that a conscientious choice to exclude? On that same note, I see reading and math in there, but you mentioned that it was better without the assessment data. Um, yeah, we it's just as good or better without the assessment data. And credit deficient is most certainly in there. That's one of our uh, bigger weights. Um, 
I mentioned earlier, it goes from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 on, on the index, whereas yeah. many other variables only go 0, 1, or 2. It's yeah, I think. 10 through 12. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, there yeah. you go. I, yeah. Yeah, I and then. Through, go ahead. Yeah, so elementary and middle school don't really use credits. Uh, reliably so that we can use that signal. In middle school, we're, we're looking into using uh, core credits, so like reading math, science, and social studies to see if a child failed in there since we don't really get accurate credit information to see if there were any course failures in core subjects, uh, but we haven't done that yet. Okay, and, and one more acronym just came in. What's LEP? Uh, again, I apologize. That is English language learners, and we should change that. I think LEP stands for Limited English Proficient, but we've since yeah. switched to English language. Yeah, chat at that. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so Ben did a great job explaining um, sort of the catalyst for why we got into this work, how we selected our indicators, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're using this in practice. Um, he referenced the data warehouse as our primary point um, for dissemination of this information. And that student profile page he showed with the big pink arrow, every teacher has access grades 1 through 12 um, to read a page like that or have a page like that for every one of their students. And then there's also various features where schools can click on for example, high risk, and it will pull up a list of all students in their school that have been identified at that time as high risk. Um, so the dissemination and the user friendliness of the tools, um, he mentioned initially a large Excel file that was given to principals to disseminate, and now this information is readily available for, for all of our educators. So that certainly has had a significant impact in the way that we're using these data. Um, and particularly with the um, early warning system. As we went through and started working with classroom teachers, again, grades 1 through 12, looking at speech language pathologists, counselors, so folks with a variety of backgrounds and um, depth of knowledge around these tools, we quickly found that we needed to do a lot of training, both on how to understand the information um, as well as how to share it. So um, our departments collaborated and spent the better part of about two and a half years doing trainings for um, schools in terms of, you know, vertically we would cluster them together, we would bring them together. Our district has been implementing multi-tiered system of support for about nine years. Um, so we would work with those school teams. Each school has an MTSS leadership team consisting of at least one administrator, school psychologist, counselor, and lead teacher. And those four individuals are responsible for the implementation and execution of MTSS at their site. So we also spent a lot of time with those teams to train and try to get this information into the hands of our over 4,000 classroom teachers. Um, one of the major things that we did in terms of moving forward, our district has early release almost every Wednesday. Um, and our educators have about 45 minutes um, every Wednesday to engage in professional learning, um, whether it's in a PLC format or something a little bit more structured. And you'll notice that the handouts that we have there really guide our school teams through um, how to use the early warning system in terms of looking at that. And for training purposes, we really focused on working um, with the high and moderate risk students and having them go through um, at the PLC level looking at um, which students, um, and this can be at the grade level for your elementary, for middle school, many of our middle schools use a taming model, and then high schools you'll often see it in a department level component. But they would walk through and identify um, which students were identified as high or moderate risk and list out and identify. Sometimes they would each take ownership depending on the access to the student or your caseload. And then they would look at the different reasons. Attendance is a great one with this. There's many reasons why we have students um, that are at risk in terms of attendance. There's disengagement, there's familial reasons, there's health reasons. So starting to drill down in terms of why is this happening. And then finally looking at um, 
some interventions. And this took some training too, and I'll go into it a little bit more around some sample um, interventions, but really helping um, our school teams capture this information and looking at it in terms of a MTSS framework. So universally, what supports do we have in place for our students around these indicators? And then looking at our students around the low to moderate risk, are there um, targeted smaller group interventions that can be done? And then finally, with our high risk, what are the individual interventions? And this is a critical component. When you're looking at some of our schools that have 1,800 to 2,000 students on a campus and you're asking teachers and staff to intervene, if you can't place it within that context and really get your arms around it, it becomes overwhelming. Um, really looking at the supports that are available in terms of that universal and small group is a critical component. After we worked with our school teams around understanding the early warning system, understanding the data and how to put it to use at the PLC level and the intervention assistance team, which is the school team, their NTSS leadership team, um, then we started working with something called academic personalized plans. And these actually were um, brought to Washoe County School District some years ago as a tool to help our students um, Ben and I both cringe at the term, but the, the bubble students, and this was really looking at our criterion reference test and those students who were right on the cusp of passing. Um, and, and we saw beyond that and looked at family engagement and um, the power around um, having an involved family, the power of a student-led conference. And so that student profile page that Ben showed you earlier became sort of our page one of these academic personalized plans um, and students would work with their teachers to understand their data and then um, have a conference with their parents and go through that page with their parents and explain what it meant. The other side of that or page two, which is housed in our student information system, was using the information to identify and select strengths and a goal in the areas of college and career readiness, uh, social and emotional learning, family engagement, and community involvement. And we partnered with several different departments across the district to train our schools to go through this. And I had mentioned earlier that one of our challenges in creating buy-in and or working with the classroom teachers was to help them understand how to share this information with families and with students and at what age. Because even if our schools aren't using the academic personalized plan process or the APP process, many of them are using um, this information gleaned from the student profile page in the early warning um, at back to school nights in student-led conferences. Um, and we have parent university classes to help parents understand their data. So um, Ben is a huge advocate that accountability is a, a support, it's a flashlight, it's not a hammer, and really working to get this information to the hands of, of everyone and being transparent around um, what the data are and what they mean and how we can grow stronger as a school community as a result of having this information. Um, and then I've talked a lot about MTSS, and we are fortunate in that um, every one of our schools has been trained and implements PBIS and RTI, which is MTSS together. Certainly with 93 schools and 64,000 students, there's a gradient in implementation, and some of our schools are stronger than others. Um, but if you <coughs> look at um, the next slide, I can talk a little bit about um, the training and how we've gone through it. So the attachment of the early warning PLC process looks at um, is a problem indicator, problem analysis, implement the plan implementation, and then how we evaluate. And some examples of what this might look like um, in terms of support for our school. Um, when you look specifically at attendance, identifying and matching intervention, resource, and support as part of the training is critical, um, sort of going into the here's what, now what, so what. 
Um, so with working with our schools, we really um, worked to build capacity in how we support our students. For attendance, we've worked closely with our um, Office of Truancy. And we have things like, for example, if we have students who are at low or moderate risk for attendance, we can place them on a 10 or 20 day monitor, a modified check-in, just check out, if you will. Um, we also are fortunate to have um, a handful of truancy officers who will help support the school in doing home visits and working to um, get those students to school. For our students that are high risk or really struggling, we also have a student attendance review board made up of a group of multidisciplinary professionals designed to help support a student and families if attendance is their primary area of concern. Uh, transiency, you'll see there, that really becomes an issue of wrapping our arms around the family and the students. We are fortunate to have family resource centers here in Washoe County. And then you also mentioned CIT, our children in transition. We actually have an entire department dedicated to supporting the families, whether it's financial resources, employment resources, um, connecting the student with transportation so they can stay at a zone school for consistency, even if they are moving from house to house or staying at a motel temporarily. Um, retention, we've talked a lot about with Read by Three, and that and the, the reading and math um, really become, becomes an individual small group tailored intervention, but hopefully you get the idea there. With credit deficiency, like many of the other districts and many of you on the line, um, we have things like intercession and summer school. We also have computer programs such as A plus that allow our students to make up those credits. Um, but the strength of the early warning system is that we can detect that much earlier on so we don't have juniors coming to us with two credits earned. We're able to really attack that early on. And then finally, suspension, we've worked very hard to, uh, we actually have a district-wide behavior support team made up of counseling, psychology, our psychology department, truancy, uh, MTSS, our behavior department, special education. It's a large multidisciplinary group that works closely um, to support the behavioral needs, whether they are in special or general education. Um, and you'll see there that tier two and tier three interventions that you might be used to, but then we also have small teams of people who will go out and help support the school and the student, um, ranging from helping them conduct the functional behavioral assessment to designing the behavior plan to fidelity checks around the implementation of the behavior plan. So very helpful there. And then finally, down below, something that we've worked really hard um, as a district is we've developed a district intervention assistance team model. And we've been doing that for about two years. And this team is made up of um, community support, such as our children's cabinet. Then we also, again, have a multidisciplinary team at the table. So you have um, truancy, social workers, mental health, um, behavior specialists. Our area superintendents will come and participate. And this team meets every Friday from 8 to 10. And it is where a school can come if they are experiencing difficulties in supporting a student behaviorally, social, emotionally, or academically. And the intent is that um, the school comes. It's a problem-solving model, similar to what we ask our schools to do. And we have the people at the table who can make the decisions and dispatch the support immediately. So um, we found that to be a very um, effective and supportive model for our schools. And that certainly any of the indicators that you see in early warning, we uh, typically see students there that are high risk, which helps. Um, I, if you go to the next slide, just looking at that problem solving model and going back to the PLC component and the handouts, we do work with the schools in terms of the PLC, at the PLC level and at the school level in terms of their intervention assistance team to really look at these data. I mentioned that um, Ben and his team have built out where you can click at any given moment and see all the students that are high, moderate, low, or no risk in your building. So we've worked with our schools to do this and look at this um, information data at least three times a year. So similar to almost that universal screening for planning purposes. 
So we work with them to go through it um, at the beginning of the year when they're looking at the students that they have. We require that all high-risk students go through the school's intervention assistance team, as well as their strong discussion at the PLC level for high and moderate risk. And then they run that again midwinter. As Ben mentioned, um, these indicators are able to be updated uh, every 24 hours. So a lot can change during that time. And that process has really helped our schools because there um, is a wealth of information. And when we talk about using multiple um, points of data to make an informed decision, when you look at the indicators and the information that it can give a school team, this has really enhanced our work and made it um, much more streamlined and efficient for our school teams to be able to funnel effective um, interventions, resources, supports to our students and to our families, which I think is a very critical component and a huge bonus around um, helping families and teachers really understand the early warning system and what that means. Okay, and then if we go on to the next slide. This is just a reminder of the student profile page um, and what this looks like. And, and we worked to design this page. To the top left, you'll see important information up there for classroom educators in terms of intervention and testing. So things like, was the student on an IEP within the last two years? Uh, were they on a 504 or designated as an English language learner? Were they receiving support through MTSS, or were they in a gifted program? So having that type of information at your fingertips, along with the early warning system, and important practice is having the two years. So even looking at this sample student, you'll see in 2012, you're able to identify high risk and figure out why. And then in year 2013, currently, we're only seeing a one for attendance. So as a PLC or as a district or a school-based IAT, that gives you a lot of information already in terms of where to start looking to design um, effective interventions and supports for that student. So this is just another um, tool when we talk about buy-in and dissemination and user friendliness. This page is shared with our families, with our students, and teachers use it. Um, in their PLC for planning purposes. So um, very valuable. It gives you in-depth in information about all the indicators that are up there so you don't have to go digging for it. Um, I can tell you our school psychologists love this page in terms of designing support and working with our families when they go in to possibly evaluate a student for support or help a school team design effective intervention. Um, they have said over and over again how much they love having all of this information. And Ben mentioned um, the drill down capability. So you'll see there using MAP as our universal screener, um, sort of mid-page, there's a drill down. Click here to see all MAP details. So if you click there, you'll be able to see all of the, all of the assess MAP assessments that student has ever taken. Down in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see attendance. Same type of thing if you click on the 12, it's hyperlinked and you can see um, attendance, CRT, he mentioned that was our criterion reference test and you could see every test the student had ever um, attempted. So those types of tools, using the early warning system in conjunction with all of this information has allowed our teams to grow um, significantly. And if we go to the next slide, um, I think we're both going to talk a little bit about um, next steps and refinement. We have been incredibly fortunate to have a lot of fun with this project and also um, working on social and emotional indicators. And we have an IES grant actually we're working at um, risk. So I'm going to let Ben talk a little bit about that too. Yeah, so um, one of the things I kind of mentioned earlier, we are looking to iterate in the next kind of generation hopefully constantly, but a new generation of early warning system. And I know there's enough kind of use around the country uh, and, and bright minds that I'm going to pay attention to what other districts and states are doing. Uh, one of the things that comes up for discussion is social-emotional measures. Again, those kind of protective factors. 
uh, do they moderate risk or the warning signal uh, that a student might show? I, and and we ha as Trish mentioned, we've done a lot of work um, on an IES grant. Uh, Trish and her team uh, in our district, uh, Dr. Laura Davidson, uh, has done tons of work on measuring social emotional competencies. We we just feel we're not there yet to include them into the system. I think as anyone would agree, the more you start using data. In, in a system like this or other, there can be unintended consequences, and we want to make sure that we get the measures right before we kind of go out with them. So it's something that we're really excited about. It's something that we have shown, you know, at, at analyzing our own data, uh, that it does. Strong social emotional competencies uh, and the like and resilience factors do moderate the risk. Um, but we don't know that we can report that at a student level yet. So it's something we're excited about, um, but it's something that we kind of want to pay more attention to before we throw it into a system that might be used in uh, 65,000 different ways. Read by three is another one that we're, there's a couple reasons I want to retool the system, and, and, and I don't think that every, every warning signal is the same for every child K through 12. So I think we can find out, while maintaining focus, find better ways to kind of look at different types of students. Read by three is a, a law that that was passed in Nevada that show that kind of mandates that if a child can't read at grade level by grade three, um, that child should be retained. Uh, and there's some other you know workarounds or just cause exemptions. But it's a really frightening thing to a lot of us in the district and I'm sure a lot of people around the country that are dealing with these type of laws. But it's a very strong impetus in getting those kids the the reading skills or the literacy skills that they need or the re literacy competencies that they need by end of grade three. Uh, and that kind of begs for multi-tiered system support. It begs for good signals early on in kindergarten or preschool uh, if the kid is going, if the child is going to need some more supports. And then graduation supports. One of the things that kind of makes me feel guilty about our early warning system is that it really shows a signal of, yeah, this child might drop out, moderate risk to drop out, high risk to drop out. Uh, but with even, you know, now with three quarters of our, our students graduating, uh, can we do better than just saying, yeah, those three quarters are on track to graduate? So can we say that they're, yeah, they're going to graduate, but they need a little bit more support to be college or post-secondary ready? Uh, or yeah, they're college ready um, and they have a chance to go to really good um, colleges really with, with strong scholarship opportunities. So just getting more signals and more positive asset-based signals to our educators around the students. And I think we can do that uh, all along our pathway. So this has been, such, like Trish said, an incredibly fun project. I feel fortunate to have worked on it or to be working on it, uh, but I also think that there's a lot of room to grow. Um, and it is fun to see, you know, people in my position don't get to work directly with kids, but it's fun to see educators using them to support students. So we'll continue to refine it um, and definitely share our work with REL and whomever else. Um, but, but yeah, the next steps are to refine it, get it better signals for um, earlier grades and high school grades, but also kind of some asset-based signals. And I hope to learn from people around the country doing that work. Okay. Well, I think we've talked about this um, quite a bit, but that component of educator training and understanding is essential to the success of the early warning system. Um, without the teachers understanding how to use it, both at the PLC and IAT level, um, but also with students and with families and what to do instructionally. So again, going back to that, here's what, you know, now what, so what, um, that component, and, and it isn't a one-time training opportunity. This um, is present in almost every training that we do. We go back to it, we refer to it, We'd, we've offered layers and depth in terms of the implementation and what it means so that they can explain it. Um, and, and that has been critical. Um, what we'll find um, is that if they don't have that depth of knowledge and they try to use it, it can go terribly wrong. Or if they don't, they shy away from it completely and are missing very powerful signals around how to intervene and support students in their classrooms and in their buildings. 
another lesson that we learned that may seem small but actually had a fairly significant impact at the beginning um, is that language matters. And you heard Ben reference it earlier in the talk that uh, the term risk um, itself is was a little bit um, difficult. In fact, we had to meet with several parents initially around the terms that were there. So you'll see us using now early warning for support versus the risk index. And that, again, ties back into that educator training and helping them have the sentence frames and the supports and opportunities to practice explaining what these data mean and, again, how can we tie them to resources, interventions, and support. Um, we have a dynamic um, department of family engagement and we are both privileged to work with them. But in addition to educator training and understanding, the ways in which we communicate this information with our students and families um, was also something that we learned. And really, the schools um, were beautiful in the ways once they began to really understand what it meant, the ways that they were able to involve the students and families and have the students have higher levels of ownership and accountability um, using the tools. We saw schools having family data nights centered around that student profile page and talking about early warning and identifying as a family what are some steps we need to take because my attendance is really impacting my educational performance or possibly my graduation outcome. Um, we also see uh, schools using this at back to school night and in parent-teacher conferences. So again, another way to get it into the hands of our students and with some of our older students when we talk about um, course selection, when we talk about opportunities for um, post-secondary um, either education or um, career pathways helping them understand strengths and weaknesses and identifying their resources and support. So pulling all of this together has been a really powerful component. And then again, I don't think that we can say it enough that when you do launch this and start training, you have to be ready to identify a process in terms of how this can be used. When you have 102 teachers and 2,000 students on a campus, you have to have uh, we use multi-tiered systems of support and help them understand how they can use this, but it also needs to be paired with the resources and support. Um, simply letting a family know or a student know that you're at high risk for attendance or you're at high risk because of poor academic outcomes or credit attainment, you have to pair that with a plan um, and be ready to evaluate the plan and make adjustments as needed. And schools and teachers need training on how to do that and need supports on how to do that for this to be um, efficient and effective and widely used. And along those lines, I think I, I want to re-answer the, the question about promising practices and graduation just because I can see the vision of my superintendent glaring at me. I, I, I didn't mean to imply that it, it's only relationships that matter. I think that's probably the biggest impact that I've seen. Um, but this pairing resources with having an early warning system has led to a lot of problem-solving discussions and we've been able to kind of make our alternative system better through big picture learning and more engaging practices at our behavior school um, and things like that. We have kind of put different options in place so um, whether a student wants to do online credit recovery or a kind of a, a night class during the spring semester or something like that, we've been able to provide better options um, and hopefully better conditions for learning for, for the students that do need uh, different supports. So I think in any district around the country, they're going to have ideas about how they can best engage their kids. I think relationship and the kids knowing that you want them engaged in, their, in the education pathway uh, is huge. Um, and then also offering some differentiated supports. Um, so for instance, tutoring uh, at different times and those different grad boost uh, or uh, credit recovery uh, or different engaging and more relevant practices, offering an internship. I think some of the Signature Academy and CTE work has helped to kind of take the long vision of engaging kids. And if you go to our next slide, uh, we're proud to 
when we first put this together, we actually failed to announce that we we made some progress from our our 56% uh, graduation rate. So yeah, one of the things that's uh, we've been happy about this. We each number each year we get a no record number of graduates, and that's really the reward. Seeing even a hundred more kids uh, across the across the graduation stage, any one of us would agree that one out of four students not graduating is still way too much. Um, but we have seen an increase in the district, and a lot of that is kind of taking those signals that we get and providing supports to the students. And one of the things we're most proud of too is. Uh, among our race and ethnicity populations, we've narrowed the achievement gap to um, double uh, single digits in most cases, uh, and each uh, student population is growing. So it, it's fun to recognize, but we still know there's urgency and a lot of work to do. Okay, that was that was really great, Trish and Ben, and, and congratulations on seeing. Um, the the benefits of the early warning system with the 75 percent now. Um, our email addresses are displayed on the screen there, so if you have questions or follow-up, um, you're welcome to email any one of us. The webinar itself will also be archived um, at the address uh, railcentral.org on the screen there. So let me just thank everyone for um, attending and sticking with us, and Trish and Ben, thank you again for taking time to present with us. And to Kenwin and John, thank you for uh, sitting in and helping facilitate.